at your Dodge Dealer showroom. It's coming soon. I, 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 I are always on the floor. So, insist on long gleaming beacon wax. WABD New York. Can machines think? The Johns Hopkins Science Review, presented by the Johns Hopkins University and WAAM in Baltimore. This is the Johns Hopkins University, famed for 76 years for its contributions to learning and scientific research. Here in the many laboratories, Hopkins scientists are probing into the secrets of science, which, when discovered, will be translated into benefits to be enjoyed by you and the people of America. Each week, we are privileged to look over the shoulders of today's scientists and catch a glimpse of their research. On this, our 181st showing of the Hopkins Science Review, we ask the scientists, can machines think? And here is Lynn Poole of Johns Hopkins to introduce this week's program. Our question this week is, can machines think? Well, we're going to present some of the evidence and let you make up your own minds, and then we're going to ask our guest to give us a positive answer to that question. Now, during the past six years, all of us have heard a great deal about electronic brains and machines that can think. Well, now, this mechanical robot here I doubt, I doubt it very much that he can think. Because as a matter of fact, I have a great deal of power over him. I can make him stop juggling, and I can put his eyes out. Now, when I pull a little switch back here, he stops juggling, and his eyes darken right away. Well, there are a lot of questions to be answered about these mechanical robots and about computers. But I'm sure that uh, you've read a great many articles about machines called automatic computers with very strange sounding names such as Maniac, ENIAC, EDVAC, and the UNIVAC. Well, now, they may be strange sounding names, but these names are made up of the initials and the brevi abbreviations of longer descriptive words. Take the ENIAC, for example. The ENIAC is made up of the words electronic, numerical, integrator, and calculator. And then the UNIVAC. The UNIVAC is simply the universal automatic computer. Now these machines that you've been hearing about are machines that we'd like to show you tonight and we have picked out the UNIVAC which is the very latest model and we're very fortunate in having one of the men who helped design and invent the ENIAC and the UNIVAC as our guest. But before I have the opportunity of introducing him, I'd like to go back to the juggler, this rubbit juggler that you saw just a mo moment ago. Why did we have him juggling? Well, a little later, our guest will tell you what a juggler and the number of balls going up has to do with the automatic computer. We are very proud at Johns Hopkins University that the inventor of the ENIAC and the UNIVAC received his PhD at Johns Hopkins. And I would like now to introduce Dr. John Mockley, and ask him what computers actually do. Automatic electronic computers are really devices for handling information, all sorts of information. And anything which the human being can direct that computer to do, it can do. It can do it faster and do it without error. Now, the uses of computers <coughs> can roughly be divided into two general classes, those of scientific sort and the business uses. And we will now take a look at some of those things being done by an actual computer in action. <coughs> some of the scientific problems <coughs> are the analysis of information gathered in aerodynamic studies in wind tunnels. Every shape 
has its own special characteristics when placed in a fast-moving stream of air. Many different shapes have to be tested. Tiny changes in design may be very important. Air turbulence, vibrations of parts, measurements of that sort. And to make use of this information, <coughs> we must make fairly complicated mathematical reductions. An automatic computer is used to analyze these measurements. In fact, mathematics underlies all phases of aircraft design. Computers are used in atomic physics to solve mathematical problems that arise in trying to discover what happens to electrons, protons, and gamma rays under various conditions in predicting the results of atomic fission. In the numerical forecasting of weather, computers analyze reports gathered in all parts of the world. These studies may eventually show what the weather <coughs> is made from, how it changes, what it's going to be, and if our weather on the Earth is affected by outside influences. Computers are used to study the rate of chemical reactions. Exactly what happens to atoms when various substances are reacted with each other chemically? What happens first and how fast the chemical products are formed? Computers can be used to test theories in physics, astronomy, statistics, chemistry, all sorts of science, and save thousands of man hours of routine drudgery. One of the uses of a business type is the problem of inventory control. Retail and wholesale outlets need to have on hand many thousands of items. How many of those should be kept on hand of each kind? When should they be reordered and how many of each? A computer can handle the whole inventory control problem and even write out the purchase orders ready to be placed in the mail. In market research, Sales figures can be analyzed to discover more efficient marketing procedures. This applies also to automobiles, fuels, steel, raw materials, farm produce. Computers can be used for tabulating and summarizing information. For example, taking census data. Other commercial uses are payroll and cost accounting, cost estimation, price adjustment, life insurance, <coughs> all sorts of business uses. An especially interesting use of computers is to help in long-range planning <coughs> and making policy decisions by management. What is done today will affect a business, say, five years from now. And to be able to decide now what the likely effects of present decisions are is awfully important. Here, computers can help. We will go into these problems in greater detail a little later. The main point I want to, know, to make now is that Computers are useful whenever we have to handle large amounts of information or where we have to make very complicated mathematical complications. In this room is a typical UNIVAC system. Delivered to the U.S. Bureau of Census in 1951, one of its main jobs has been to summarize the information gathered in the 1950 census. The electronic circuits behind these panels do tens of thousands of additions every minute. To use such speed, we need the devices which stand on the right. Each unit can read or record on magnetic tape, and the millions of numbers and letters on such tapes are all controlled automatically by the computer. All the information used in any problem is furnished to the UNIVAC on such reels of tape. The information the computer will need for a particular job is given to the typist who sits in front of the unit typer. Using a keyboard much like a standard typewriter, she records the written code of directions onto a metal tape, which will later tell the UNIVAC every detail of its job. For each number and letter typed on the keyboard, there is a special pattern of magnetic areas created on the tape. The computer must be supplied with facts and figures, but it must also be given instructions as to what to do with these facts and figures, that is, how to use them in the problem. Here is the typist recording instructions. They must be complete in every detail, telling the machine what to do and exactly what order to do it in. All of this must be worked out carefully ahead of time by trained personnel. Some sets of instructions are used over and over in different parts of the problem, or even in entirely different problems. These standard procedures can be recorded on tape and used as often as desired, without further expenditure of human thought. The original facts gathered by house-to-house -house interviews in the 1950 census are already on other tapes. Such tapes have been prepared by the automatic reading of a punched card file, which the Census Bureau made from the house-to-house -house reports. The instructions are now recorded on the tape, and are ready to be taken to the UNIVAC computer. 
tapes with instructions and factual information can be prepared in advance so that the computer will not stand idle waiting for a problem. Here we see the instruction tape being mounted on the first Uniservo. Other Uniservos have already taken their data tapes. A special connecting device makes it unnecessary to thread the tape through the reading head. When this instruction tape is ready and the door is closed, the computer automatically reads off the instructions and begins the problem. The computer, having obtained its instructions now, can command the other reels of magnetic tape to supply the data which it will work upon. The various tapes are put in motion as required, and running at 10 feet per second, they supply 10,000 digits, or letters of the alphabet, every second, as long as the central computer requires them. As the desired tabulations are built up inside of the computer, the results can be recorded at the same rate on another magnetic tape. Here we see the second Uniservo receiving the results from the census problem which has just been run. When the light flashes on, the computer automatically causes this reel of tape to be rewound. When it stops, the problem is done. The operator then opens the cabinet, removes the tape, and takes the results to a Uniprinter. The computer is now free to begin another problem. The answers to the problem which was just run are now on a reel of tape. The Uniprinter reads the answers off the magnetized tape and prints them out on an automatic typewriter. After mounting the tape in the reading device, the start switch is thrown and the patterns of magnetized areas on the tape are converted back to electrical impulses which operate the typewriter. At 10 characters per second, the Uniprinter reads and prints the tables that have been prepared by the computer. These tables are part of the answers to the census problem which was just run. They are the results of adding up the various kinds of information which came from all the people in a certain part of the country. Not only figures are typed out, but words describing the table and headings for the columns, so that anyone who looks at the table will know what it is about. Columns can be labeled by occupation or age, or whatever group is being tabulated. A number of uniprinters can be used at the same time to keep up with the output of the computer or the tapes can be filed away until the information on them is needed. Thus, the problem starts out as numbers and letters on paper, is put on tape by the Unityper, is supplied to the computer by the Uniservos, which also puts the answers on tape, and the Uniprinter changes the answers back to words and numbers on paper. The Univac is designed to be completely automatic from the time the information tapes are mounted until the time the answers are ready. But it is sometimes helpful to listen in, so to speak, to follow the progress of the computer's work. The supervisory control at the left is used for this purpose. There also are many circuits which keep elaborate checks on the accuracy of the computer. These also indicate their findings on the supervisory control board. This shows the way in which the keyboard connected to the supervisory control can be used to insert new information in the middle of a problem. The alphabetic and numeric keyboards here are like those on the Unityper. And this shows a Univac computer being assembled. The Census Bureau computer is not the only one of its kind. Other Univac systems of exactly the same design are being used today, and still more are being built. Before the casework and doors are put in place, the vacuum tubes and other components, which are the working parts of the Univac, are exposed. Here are several computers now under construction at the Remington Rand plant in Philadelphia, each in a different stage of completion. This one, already in operating condition, is being prepared for a customer acceptance test. A door in the side of the Univac opens into a small room in which the maze of wiring is completely accessible to the engineers, who are carefully checking to see that every circuit performs as it should. Inside the computer are also seven large cylinders, which are the high-speed mercury tank memories. These store the digits of information, which the computer must have immediately handy for use in the middle of a problem. Each of these cylinders can store almost 2,000 numbers or letters of the alphabet. Any such number can be found by the machine in less than a thousandth of a second. The vacuum tubes on the outside of the computer are easily removable, since they are mounted on chassis, which can be taken out for inspection. 
A closer look at the supervisory control board will show us the many switches the operator uses to listen in on different parts of the computer. Here also are the signal lamps, which indicate whether the machine is functioning correctly. Not only are the arithmetic operations thoroughly checked, but the temperature of the mercury in the memories is controlled, and the lights which are flashing here indicate that these control circuits are working properly. The numerous voltages which are necessary for the electronic circuits are constantly being checked also, not by a human engineer, but by a fully automatic circuit, which repeatedly scans all the voltages, one after another, to see whether they are within the correct operating levels. This Univac system is working for the U.S. Bureau of Census, but the scene would look no different if it were solving problems of business, commerce, finance, aircraft design, military strategy, economics, or market research. All of these come within the province of a general purpose computer like the Univac system. Working seven days a week, it solves problems that will affect our way of life and even the safety of our country. By handing over our mental drudgery to such obedient and accurate devices, man will find more time to expand his knowledge and understanding of the universe. Now that you've seen this giant machine in operation, I'm perfectly sure that a question that you would like to have answered is, how is it possible for a machine made up of tubes and thousands and thousands of miles of wire, how is it possible for this thing to do what it actually does? How can it subtract and add and multiply and divide? How can it store away things way back in this so-called mine and then come up with them later to answer a question? Well, Dr. Mockley has a few gadgets, as he calls them, that he thinks will show us exactly how the principles of the UNIVAC operate. The complicated jobs which a UNIVAC does are broken down into simple parts in order for the UNIVAC to do them. And in the same way, for us to understand how a UNIVAC operates, we must break down these things into very simple parts indeed. First, let's start with a familiar office adding machine. This adding machine can make up a multiplication or a division from the simple parts of addition or subtraction. And in so doing, it must be given the problem and it must be told what operation is performed. And we see that it automatically carried out the subtractions necessary to give us a division and recorded that for us. Now, what kind of parts enable that machine to do even such simple jobs? Well, we can take apart another little mechanical gear device which I have here, which can illustrate the way in which additions can be done. If we have this set at 150 or 150 and wish to add two to it, we merely turn a wheel two positions. If we wish to add five more, we can turn this wheel to the position seven. And so we might expect to go on 158, 159, 160, but instead it turns to 200. Well, this machine is not built on the decimal system. And in fact, it's built for another system which you all know very well, timekeeping. And the reason why it went to 200 was because after one hour and 59 minutes comes two hours. And this little wheel here has only six positions to take account of the fact that there are only 60 hours, 60 minutes in the hour. <clears throat> now, in an electronic computer, we have even simpler parts to make use of, which can only have two positions and not six. And because we have such simple parts, therefore, we use a system which is even simpler than this. Instead of the wheels and gears which you see there, we use electric signals. And each signal can either be present or absent. Tonight, instead of bringing a handful of signals with me, I have brought some ball bearings to represent the signals. And if we use a single ball in this position to represent one, then we can use that same ball in this position to represent two, since we can't put two balls in the same slot. If we want to represent four, we move the ball along to there, and if we want to represent eight, we re move the ball along to there. By combinations of these, then, we can build up any number we like. In this case, we have four and two, or six, whereas if we had 
put the balls there, we would have one and two or three as the number represented. Now that we know how to represent numbers by simple signals which are on or off, we will try to find out how to add such numbers. To add them, we have to have a device which can add one and one. If we can get that far, then we can add anything. <coughs> it might se seem simple enough to add one and one, but we're going to start with something simpler yet, adding one and zero. And this board here has been constructed with the balls as the signals and a moving part which plays the role of the vacuum tubes in our computer. If this ball rolls down to here, it will indicate a one. And if we release that ball, that's exactly where it will come. One plus no ball here being zero will give us one. Now we must be able to do it the other way around, zero on this side and one on that side, and still get one. <coughs> the same ball arrives the same position when you do it that way. The real test of this device is when we try to add one and one, and we must not get two balls there, because two balls there would not represent two in this system. A single ball in another position represents two, and that's exactly what we got, because this rocker arm balanced when it received two balls at once. Our vacuum tube circuits work in much the same way. To give a signal in a different circuit when it receives one and one. Now we must be able to store those numbers and feed them rapidly to the adding machine. And we do that with our ball bearings, with a device which releases a ball here whenever a switch is tripped by a ball. We can set up such a pattern here and watch these balls rolling down here. And as they go in the back of the apparatus, they trip off switches which release exactly the same pattern of balls over again. So we can make these signals here correspond to our numbers. In the actual computer, instead of the balls, we use signals which become sound waves in a tube of mercury and these are then amplified and sent back through and can be, the same patterns can be continued over and over so that the uh, resulting patterns can be stored as long as we like. And the beautiful thing about it is that only a few tubes in the amplifier are able to handle a thousand or so of these signals representing the units. That is exactly why we have said that the juggler represents the operations going on in the memory of the computer, because with two hands, he is able to handle a number of balls. The computer outdoes him with its electronics by juggling 1,000 signals with just a few tubes. <coughs> now, in addition to that, we must be able to store the numbers permanently, as well as for the high-speed operations. And for that, we use a magnetic tape, which is wound on the reel here so that on 1,200 feet of tape, we can store more than a million digits by packing them about 100 to the inch. <coughs> Those little digits on there are put on by magnetized spots. And by the patterns we put on, we can represent not only all the numbers, which I've shown you how to add, but also we have extra combinations which represent the letters of the alphabet and thus get into the commercial and business applications of computers with the same kind of electronic system. <coughs> that is the essence of how we get all these things done. Well, Dr. Markley tells me that really the UNIVAC is not very complicated because the action of the UNIVAC is merely an extension of the simple principles that he's just demonstrated for us here. Well, now, a little while ago, Dr. Markley told us what the UNIVAC can do. But I'd like to ask him if he'd be a little more specific and show us a problem or two, and then show us how the UNIVAC, UNIVAC solves these problems. Well, the simplest problem that we can uh, demonstrate is probably that of trying to fill the pay envelopes in a uh, factory where there are many thousands of employees to be paid. 
they want to be paid in cash, then for any particular amount that each employee receives, we have to have the right number of bills and the right amount of change. But for a human being to do that would take a long time. And the, we must have a computer which counts up the number of $20 bills, $10 bills, and other denominations to be requested from the bank in order that this will all come out right. The computer can do this in a way which <coughs> would stagger the human because it only takes a small fraction of a second for any one of these things to be done. The essence of the operation is that if a particular paycheck is 4696, for instance, then to find out whether a $20 bill is needed, we subtract 20. If there is still something left over, then subtracting 20 again will show us that another $20 bill is needed, and so on. The computer counts up all of these for all the pay envelopes and tells us exactly how many are needed. <clears throat> In the inventory control problem, as I mentioned before, it is most astonishing probably that not only can we keep track of the inventory in the, any given operation, but that the computer itself can determine how much must be ordered and write out the purchase orders because it will have on its magnetic tapes a file of all of the firms from which the orders should be made. Coming back to the problem that was put me first as to whether computers think, it's my opinion that we, as long as the computers are our slaves and are doing our bidding and must be told exactly what to do, it is hardly right to say that they do the thinking. I'm sure after seeing this demonstration, we'll all agree with Dr. Mockley that the computer can't think because it's the human being that has to push the button and put all the information in there so that this great UNIVAC can do its work. As a matter of fact, the UNIVAC is being used for so many things. It's being used in elections to find out what the results are and prognosticate as the results of these elections come in by the hour in election campaigns. Now, the UNIVAC is also being used by scientists. It's going to do a great deal of work for the scientist, so that the scientist himself can be free to do other things. Now, we hope you'll be with us next week when we answer a question, how clean is clean? When you wash your clothing, or your hands, or your hair, do you know exactly how clean they become? Do you know how and why soap attacks dirt and removes it from cloth and skin? Do you know why some clothing remains gray and dirty even after it has been washed many times? The science of modern detergents is an area of study in which many chemists are working. Next week, Dr. Cornelia Snell, well-known chemist, will answer the question, how clean is clean? The Johns Hopkins Science Review is produced by Lynn Poole in association with Robert Fenwick and Warren Whiteman, directed by Paul Kane. The associate director is Ed Serro. Art direction by Barry Mansfield. Your narrator has been Joel Chaseman. Portions of this program have been mechanically reproduced. The Johns Hopkins Science Review originates in the studios of WAAM in Baltimore. Television Network. Guide Wright follows with Tony and Jan Arden. Eisenhower answers a General, in order to make ends meet last year, I had to go into debt. You're not the only one. Last year, and next year.